Hi, everyone. I hope you're having a good day. I'm Mike Good of Togetherness, and I'll be your host today. I'd like to welcome you to the Get Together in this show where we have conversations to empower people who are fighting back against dementia. Today, we're in for a great show because I've got Judy Bonilla, who will be sharing tips and strategies on the six most important lifestyle factors that support improving your brain health. Now, as the caregiver of someone with Alzheimer's or another type of dementia, brain health is obviously something you're very concerned about. And while there's no 100% answer on how to prevent Alzheimer's, there are definitely lifestyle choices that just make sense to implement and improve our odds. Judy Bonilla is a gerontologist, a Hispanics and philanthropy pet fellow, and the founder of Advocates for Aging and the nonprofit organization Aging or Advocates for Aging Cares. She's also the creator of interactive educational health and public safety programs for older adults, including her innovative program, Brain Fit Now and the Brain Booster 6. Hello, Judy. Hello, Mike. It's great to be here. Thank you for having me. You're very welcome. Thanks for being here. See our rooms filling up and remember everyone, you can hit the chat and let us know how you're doing. And once again, if you're having any video problems, please hit that refresh button because I was just in one of these the other day and we all had to hit refresh. So technical issues happen. <laughs> Sorry for that, Judy, but please go ahead. Oh, certainly. Um, again, as Mike outlined, I'm here in San Diego and what I do is create and develop programs that actually enable adults to thrive within their community because most of us do want to stay and age in our community. Often we used to hear the term aging in place. My belief is that we're going to age in our community and to do that we want to thrive and that's where I developed the Brain Booster 6. That's wonderful, Judy, and um, it's exciting. I've actually taken Judy's class here locally and um, found it to be really exciting. So it should be a really great educational um, show. Excellent. Would you like me to start now? Yes, please. Go ahead, Judy. Great. I'm just going to turn my screen over to everyone and let me do that one more time. Great. All right, as Mike mentioned, I am a gerontologist. I do practice throughout San Diego County. And through this um, work online workshop, I'm able to reach a lot more people. And that's the goal of my work as a social gerontologist. This is our roadmap. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about how Brain Fit, Fit Now was developed. We're gonna go through the Brain Booster 6 and then most importantly, we're going to give you an action plan. And as we know, great to have a map, but you have to put the gas in the car and you have to know where you're going. And that's the purpose of that action plan. All right, well, we're already having our first first technical, technical hiccup here. Um, so hi, Helen. Hi, Lo Lois. Hi, Virgie. Hi, Susan. Hopefully, Judy will get right back. You know, it's funny, we were on here for, we were on here for about 40 minutes before the show without any problems. And of course that technology God wants to kick us in the butt. But I did have the benefit of taking Judy's course um, because <clears throat> there is a lot of hype out there about brain health and about how to stay healthy. And I'm definitely somebody that doesn't want to be spreading hype and um, I, I don't believe you can just take, you know, start using a special herb or something and, and fix things. And, and Judy's course definitely doesn't talk that way. It's definitely um, more about lifestyle choices and, and how having a well-rounded um, life like, can help you know, prevent, prevent brain, um, an unhealthy brain, if you will. But, Hi there. Well, it's great to be back. And it was so interesting. We were talking about live TV. We were talking about uh, live TV. And uh, well, we just experienced some of that. <laughs> so I'm going to go back to screen share. And we still have most of our attendees. So <laughs> great. Okay, let's see. All right. Well, I'm hoping, Mike, you can get an affirmative that everyone can see the PowerPoint. I can, I can see it, so 
beautiful. Yeah. I think we're ready. All right. So as I was explaining, here is our roadmap. We have three main pieces, and that's just a little bit about BrainFit now, the Brain Booster 6, and again, most importantly, that action plan so you can take actionable items and make them part of your daily lifestyle. So what many of you know from firsthand experience is that these are a few of the risk factors for Alzheimer's. Again, what we do know is just because we're getting older it does not mean we are going to get Alzheimer's disease. Family history, again, yes, family members may have Alzheimer's, but that does not mean you are going to get it. And lastly, genetics does play a role. However, what do we know? And when I say we, I'm talking about neuroscientists. And the experts are saying, these are risk factors, just like everything in our life. They're risk factors. They are important to acknowledge. However, they do not determine our destiny. BrainFit now got started at my work at the Navy Medical Center here in San Diego. I was an intern there from San Diego State and I was doing a literature review on brain health in the Senior Health and Wellness Department and program the Navy offers to its military retirees and their dependents. If you are a member, if you are a military retiree or again a dependent, I suggest you contact your local base and see if they might be offering a health and wellness program. So many on TRICARE are eligible for these programs and they're pretty individualized as far as base and location. However, throughout the United States and throughout the world, the Navy as well as other military branches are taking a really proactive approach to improving the health and wellness of its members. As I mentioned, I was doing a literature review. And what I did notice is that there were some, some distinctive areas and recommendations on what you could do to improve and maintain your brain health. So what I did is after all that research, look for evidence-based science that would enable me to connect and identify the best recommendations and take it one step further. So who I've relied on in my research have been the big names, Alzheimer's Association, AARP, the World Alzheimer's Report, which was just issued this September, and then True neuro, a Neuroscience, Dr. Gary Small out of UCLA, and Dr. Paul Nussbaum out of University of Pennsylvania, and he is actually a neuropsychologist, and I have a little bit more information about him as we'll go through. So again, what I did is go to the experts to identify and confirm some of the patterns I was seeing throughout my research. So again, as I was looking at this, I saw the risk factors for Alzheimer's and dementia, and then I started to identify some of the best recommendations to prevent or delay the onset of symptoms. So this is what it looked like. BrainFit now is a program I developed. The UCLA Longevity Center and Dr. Nussbaum have pretty much coalesced certain areas. You see in that second column, the World Alzheimer's Report in red identified these factors as decreasing, and the Alzheimer's Association also has about five different principles that they identify as reducing your risk for Alzheimer's and dementia. The reason I'm showing you this slide is that you can see the pattern that started to evolve when I started doing this research. So many, again, we see that first line where it talks about exercise, activity. I interpret this as a walk and talk because what do I know? Good heart health is good brain health. All areas looked at nutrition and diet as being a 
definite factor in what you could do as far as improving your lifestyle choices. Now, some of the things we've seen out there have been around brain games and learning and mental exercise. Again, each of these organizations called it something different, but in the end, what I saw was learning. Next, we see the importance of maintaining a social connection. Some called it activity. I personally like the idea of giving people a social prescription, meaning that is just as significant, that social connection as learning, lifelong learning, as nutrition, as exercise. Next, we see the stress management. And again, everyone had a particular look at that. Now here you'll see some differentiators. You see the Alzheimer's Association is concerned about head trauma. They at that time had not embraced stress management. The World Alzheimer's Report was focused on your cardio. However, the UCLA Longevity Center was one of the first leaders to identify the risk factors for chronic stress in the development of cognitive decline. Now, what you'll notice that differentiates brain fit now is that we include everything that you see from UCLA, from the World Alzheimer's Report, and from the Alzheimer's Association, but we also focus on the baseline of health management. And I'm gonna be going into that in a little bit more detail. So this is a brain booster six. Health management, nutrition, brain games and training, fitness, social RX, and stress management. Now I know most people are always looking for that civil bullet, that magic concoction, that cure-all. There isn't one. Brain health is complex and again, as we live our lives, we know whether it's choosing a relationship, buying a car, buying a house, it's not just one thing. You base your decisions on so many things. And that's the same with improving your brain health. Now I spoke earlier about the health management and for you who are doing caregiving, this is so crucial because the message to you is that you want to make sure you are taking care of yourself. You will, I think many of you might be seeing the early um, recommendations of self-nurturing, self-care for caregivers, because often as caregivers, we have a tendency to neglect ourselves because we're focused on providing care for our loved one. And I have been a caregiver, so I understand that aspect. And I know I did not do as good a job as I might have. One of the things about health management I want to bring to your attention, it too is complex. In the research I conducted, hearing, traumatic brain injury, which I can include in fall prevention, vision, medication, chronic conditions, and dental care can all be contributors to cognitive decline. So again, as you can see, when we look at health management, there are so many aspects of it that truly need our care. For those of you on Medicare, you know that vision, hearing, and dental may not often be covered by Medicare. They might be covered, again, uh, by one of your plans, but again, it is not under that particular Medicare umbrella. So you often have to pay these at a higher copay or out of your pocket. And sometimes those get neglected. It's important that again, you start looking at those things as ways to improve your brain health because they are so interconnected. And today I'm going to just be giving a high level, so I can't go into tremendous detail, but it's really important for you to see how this all fits together. I'm going to leave this, this slide up a little bit longer because I'm hoping you're going to um, make some notes and most importantly, ask yourself, when was the last time I had my vision tested? 
when was the last time I had my, uh, I saw my dental care provider? Because those can be really important in reducing your chance for falls. And that again, really uh, brings into so many things into play when it comes to a traumatic brain injury. Some of the interesting statistics I want you to be aware of is that one in three adults, uh, again, as you see, over age 65 fall. And that 60% of falls often occur in the home. And lastly, among individuals 65 or plus, falls are often the leading cause of death. So again, take this information and think about how you might be able to fall proof your home so that you do not become one of the statistics. One of the great things about getting information is a sense of empowerment. Once you know you might be at risk, we know we can do something about decreasing our risk factors, our chances of a fall. And again, that ties in to your health management. One of the other keys is America, about 43% of Americans do not know that they have a hearing loss. Again, a hearing loss can increase your risk factors for social isolation. If you're not hearing well, people tend to self-segregate. And often it's happened so slowly, it's imperceptible, people just start to self-isolate. They may not give a reason because they don't realize they're losing their hearing. Again, seeing an audiologist is one of the important things that you can do for yourself to identify. And that way you can come up with a strategy to compensate for any loss. This is what glaucoma looks like. And again, this is also one of those conditions that happen so slowly that people often do not notice it's happening. It affects your vision and as you can see, the world starts to get a little bit smaller. You may not notice it unless you're driving perhaps and you realize you cannot, you can no longer see out of the corner of your eye. I mention this because often falls occur in the evening and you don't realize that maybe you do have glaucoma and you don't see everything. However, your vision is reduced so you don't see where you're walking. It's interesting to note that African Americans have a six times percent higher incidence of blindness due to glaucoma. Again, there is, there is treatment for the symptoms so you may be able to arrest it at a certain level, but the idea is that you see a vision care provider so that you can understand what your risk is and know what you can do to stave off the symptoms. I mentioned this earlier um, about medication and its role in health management. I actually ran into uh, a pharmacist while I was traveling to a conference and when they find out one of their patients has fallen, one of the first things they do is look at their medication. You want to make sure you are not, I'll say, um, affecting your medication with duplicates, over medicating yourself, or perhaps not taking your medication at the right time. Again, the medication that's dispensed to you is meant to be taken at certain times for certain reasons. In one of my Brain Fit Now classes, one of my students was actually taking her blood pressure medicine in the evening, or actually, excuse me, in the morning because she felt it was um, making her get up at night and she was afraid of falling. Well, it turns out she really needed to be taking that medication in the evening or when the doctor prescribed it to her. So what you wanna do if you are taking medication, you wanna make sure you are taking the correct amount, that you are reducing your risk 
for duplication. I think some of you may be familiar with Coumadin. Um, it was one of the blood early blood thinners. I have another student of mine who was taking Coumadin along with natural supplements. The reason that I mentioned this so, um, again, and I really want to make this point, is that you can have a drug interaction. If you're over 50, you normally have at least one chronic condition. If you're over 65, you might have two. So if you are taking multiple drugs, multiple medications, uh, perhaps a supplement, you might innocently be causing your drug, your medications not to work as prescribed or actually exacerbating their use. So again, having your local pharmacist review your medications is really one of the most singular important things that you can do to reduce your risk of falls and also reduce your risk of memory loss, lack of concentration, and confusion because those are sometimes the indicators that we think might be attributed to Alzheimer's disease and it turns out no it was just the medication. So again, this is, as a caregiver, this is one of the things that you can do to make sure you're looking after yourself. I mentioned earlier that if you are over 50, you might have one chronic condition. These are, the, these are what are considered chronic conditions, and you can see they range from allergies to diabetes, to recovery in a stroke, to heart disease. So it runs the gamut. So know that you are not alone. And the reason I focus in on this is because you, certainly I was talking about the living well with chronic conditions. Again, this is a program that's available at no charge throughout the country. Again, this is delivered through community centers, senior centers through healthcare programs. What I was saying is that I like about this program, it not only helps you manage your condition, it also gives you the opportunity to teach the program because it is a peer-led program. So again, in teaching something, you often learn more about how to manage a condition. Again, this is called the Living Well with Chronic Conditions program. It's offered throughout the United States. It can be in a, um, in a community center, in a senior center, and you can also take it online. So again, this is one of those great tools that you may not be aware of. Again, that's a Living Well with Chronic Conditions. It's an evidence-based program to improve the outcome of managing a long-term chronic condition. The next topic is nutrition. Again, you may have seen the blue zones out in the community, heard about plant-based diets. There's definitely evidence that this is an opportunity for you to improve your brain health. When we talk about nutrition, some, some of the things, hi Mike, did I lose you again? No, you didn't lose me. I was, okay. uh, I was chatting with Lois and Lois's mom, Margaret. Hi, Margaret. Oops, I have to switch my screen. Hi, Margaret. Hope everyone's doing well over there. And um, we're, just, we're getting along over here. So so I, I put the um, Living Well with Chronic Conditions. Is mm -hmm. that a, just dot .com or Judy? I'm sorry. No, actually, that's the name of the program. And if uh, you have a local community center yeah. or senior center, you can call them and ask them when they're offering it. And I'll actually have the details on my website. Um, right. So that's another way to follow up. I, I apologize if you already said that. I was doing that juggling thing. All right. That's okay. Back to you. Okay. The next topic is on nutrition. Again, one of my favorite and when I say favorite, because it is so valuable, is looking at that Mediterranean diet. We often have heard eating a rainbow of colors. The reason why you want to eat that rainbow is chances are it is going to give you the optimum 
possibility of including antioxidants, carbohydrates, omega-3s, water, and micronutrients, which are all part of a well-balanced diet. And what do we know about most of us? We want it to be convenient. However, convenient is all how we frame it. So if we know that eating a rainbow of colors is going to improve our health, then that is what we're gonna pick up at the grocery store. So I've got a few examples. Here's a plate of the Mediterranean diet. Again, I was talking about the Mediterranean diet and what I like about this is this actually gives you a visual so again, you can see when the, someone says a plant-based diet, because that I'm, I'm so excited. I've been teaching BrainFit now the last three years. Within the last, I'll say three to four months, I have heard so many people recommending a plant-based diet. This is what it looks like. Half of your plate is gonna be on greens, vegetables. And this is where you get to be creative. Protein is still there, grains are still there, but again, it's focusing on a meal that has something green, something colorful. Think of that rainbow. The other part of this, I have students who say, you know what, I like the idea of this, I can't do it all in one go. Well, then maybe you choose one meal, for instance, Every breakfast that you make is going to be more plant-based or you're going to add some green and vegetable into every meal. It's making those small lifestyle changes that you can continue over a lifetime. That's where you get the benefit. One of my best tips for you is to take advantage of this farm to table movement. Most of the cities throughout the United States now have a farmer's market somewhere in the area. That can be a fantastic opportunity for you to try new fruit, new vegetables and put them on their plate knowing that you are gonna get the best quality best taste. I have to admit, I, I was lazy. I didn't want to cook asparagus, so I went ahead and bought uh, asparagus in the can. It tasted nothing like real asparagus. And if that had been my first experience with asparagus, I probably would have never looked at asparagus, asparagus again. So what is my hack for that? I will now purchase fresh asparagus, steam it, and then just have it in my refrigerator. So again, shop at your local farmer's market, buy the real produce because that's where you're gonna get your nutrients. And more importantly, you're gonna like the way it tastes. And what do we know? If we like the way it tastes, we're more likely to eat it and not throw it out. Fitness. You've heard this for years on why you should do it because you're gonna look great, you're gonna feel great. Well, you know what's even more important? It's great for your brain health. This is what we do know that heart health is brain health and getting your body moving is gonna increase how your brain is being fed. The things that you wanna understand is that it's gonna be a habit and that there is a connection between the heart and the brain health. Now you see the power of 10, and I've got another little visual because Americans, only about 15% of us get the amount of exercise we need each day. And when I started looking at this program, I thought, how can I encourage everyone? How can I get people moving more? And that's when I came up with a power of 10. I live in a small community. And when I work from home, for every hour I'm sitting at my desk, when it turns, I'll say 8.50, 9.50, I get up and walk five minutes out my door, five minutes back, 10 minutes. The next hour, five minutes up, five minutes back. There are some days by doing just that 10 minute interval, 
I get my five miles in and it shows up on my Fitbit. I've also had the opportunity to meet some of my neighbors who want to know what I'm doing. For those of you who say, you know, I'm not sure if I can walk five minutes or maybe the weather is, is inclement so you can't, maybe going up and down stairs, holding onto the railings, walking around the house, going out to the mailbox if it's a distance. Again, you don't want to be macho about it and do 15 minutes. The idea is to do five minutes up, five minutes back, three minutes up, three minutes back. The idea is to do it consistently so your body is trained to get up and start moving. It's interesting. Within this last year, you may have heard the phenomenon of sitting is a new smoking. Sitting for long periods of time is being proven to be unhealthy for us. So again, the power of 10 fits in perfectly with an easy to do hack that you can incorporate in your life. So perhaps maybe you only get four walks and that's fine. That might be four more than what you're doing today. Here's my tip on walking. For most of us, uh, I don't think there's any snow on the ground. One of the great community tools might be a meetup. You might be familiar with this. This is a community led group usually by one of your neighbors that holds something called a meetup. It's meetup.com. I hold one in my community where we get together once a week for a walk. Not only do we get our exercise, it's a social event. It connects you to your community. Meetups happen all over the world. So it's a great way to open up your community and take advantage on what you can what what there is to offer and again i know as caregivers coordinating that respite care does play into this however if you have a schedule organizing that respite care this might be your incentive to use that service and actually make an appointment for you to get out and get moving so again, tip number three is take advantage and look up meetups and see if there's one that might be close to your home. Now this is an important one, brain games versus training. I know I wanna say about two, three years ago, this was so hot, brain games, brain training was gonna be the be all end all to promote um, great brain health and stave off dementia. Well, the research is still out. What we do know is that brain training has to be novel it has to challenge you and most importantly there has to be a, ver a variety so if those of you who might be doing sudoku or crossword puzzles great that's fun however it doesn't get harder for you dynamically you can purchase perhaps more difficult games but it doesn't challenge you in the way that is true brain training. For those of you who do enjoy Sudoku and crosswords, I challenge you to use your non-dominant hand. That gives you a little bit more of a workout, but again, use those as something fun and something entertaining and know that really isn't brain training. I have a slide here and some of you, um, Mike, we're gonna try and do a poll here. I'd like to know how many people might see two faces here. Yeah, all right. So it'll take about, there's about a 20 second lag before they'll hear your okay. question. So I think I know the answer, so I'm gonna be quiet. Okay. <laughs> so again, how many people see two faces? I don't and know who. I don't know who draws these things, but that's quite a bit of creativity in itself. It is, and this is a very old one, I have to say. And how many people see three faces? I, I know I have at times. Right now I'm not, though. And that could be the stress factor, Mike, I'll be honest. <laughs> because stress does affect our thinking. And that's often why when people say, it went clean out of my head. I don't remember. I was so stressed. That's your brain on stress. Well, here's how I'm going to show you. 
there are actually three faces, and I have names for them. The 1800, the 1800s woman, I'm going to click that. That's the tip of her little nose. So she is facing, I'll say it's to my left, it might be your right, but that red arrow is pointing to the tip of her nose. There's a babushka, and that is her nose. Again, that yellow arrow is pointing to her nose. And lastly, hmm? Oh, I was going to say, and I think she's wearing the green, the green beret. I, I was good. I, I and the way I usually identify her, if you notice that um, stole, it's around her neck. And lastly, there's a Scotsman, and the Scotsman is wearing a tam, and he has a rather large, prominent nose. The reason why I'm showing you this is this gives you a perfect example of how each of our brains takes in information. Some of us saw only one face, some of us saw two, some of us saw three. It has nothing to do with our intelligence. It has everything to do with how we perceive information. And that's exactly how brain training works. So this is a slide that tells you what brain training actually does. Some of you may have um, have memberships to brain training software online. When you take those initial battery of tests, when you sign up for, say, Posit Science or FitBrains or any of those that have a subscription, what they do is measure your speed, concentration, memory, reaction, and logic and they identify a baseline. Then what they do is gear the programs to your weakest deficits so that you are trying, they are trying to improve those areas you're weakest in. And this is the interesting part. When I first started teaching class, uh, I asked people who were, who were enrolled in these programs and what I found out is that people would quit the programs because they didn't like failing. It was only when I asked them to reframe this and to understand that the brain training programs were geared to continually move the post a little bit further. So when you started to do well, they would move the goalpost a little bit further. So again, this is almost stretching you each time you play these games. Again, the science is mixed on brain training. Where I see the real benefit is in lifelong learning. And that's tip number four. Lifelong learning is where across the board, we see the benefit. For many of you, Oasis might be an option. For others, it's adult classes. The great thing is that as a caregiver, you, if you can't always get away, there are so many free programs online that offer you the opportunity for lifelong learning. So my best advice, if you enjoy Sudoku, if you enjoy crosswords, please continue doing them. Do them with your non-dominant hand. But more importantly, learn something new. If you're fantastic at languages, I encourage you, try learning sign language. If you have occasion to have a dance partner, I suggest learning dance. If you are a, um, oh gosh, a line dancer, take another dance that will challenge you. One of the interesting uh, research papers I wrote was on learning how to tango. Now, if they could turn tango into a line dancing, class, I think that would be fantastic. The Again, the object is to stretch yourself, to stretch that learning. I mentioned earlier the social prescription. This may be toughest for some of us because becoming social requires us to connect with perhaps people we do not know, to explore different areas, 
and most importantly to make a commitment to doing this i often talk to students who say judy i'm not i'm an introvert it's not my nature to go out and meet people well i'm asking again for you to reframe this and thinking about if somebody said if you met one new person once a week that would improve your brain health would that be an incentive I think some of you have seen that commercial where they talk about if one bit of broccoli improved your health or one bit of uh, one, uh, I think, push up would improve your health. It's the same with social connections. Social connections can do so much not only to connect you to others, but also to really reduce your risk of social isolation. It can also give you a sense of purpose. I think some of us um, have had the experience where you went to a class because you knew others were there. Other words were looking forward to seeing you. It was your role to play within that organization. The other thing that often you don't hear about is the ability to build social capital. Social capital is also similar to monetary, it's your contribution to the community. And the best way that I can explain this is oftentimes each of us has a contact, a resource. For example, here in San Diego, there is this company that will come out and clean your drains for $20. Flat fee. Toilet, kitchen, bathtub, they will come out. Somebody at the office was asking, do you know somebody who, you know, I need a plumber. You know, well, what do you need done? Oh, I need my drinks snake. There were four people in the office who knew this company. When we found out about it, we this is social capital, being able to help someone with your resources. Can I tell you, we had a good laugh over that. And it brought us a little bit closer because we all had a shared common experience. And that's how you can build connections. My hack for number five in building social connections, laughter yoga. Laughter yoga is around the world. And if you have the opportunity, please take advantage of this. Normally it's free. There might be a nominal charge. Again, normally it's free. Laughter yoga is one of those human experience that from feeling awkward helps you build community. The great thing about it is that because you're laughing, it also sets out those endorphins that make you feel good. So again, hack number five is laughter yoga. Again, these programs are throughout the world often again at senior centers community centers and if you're part of a support group they will often bring in somebody who's a laughter yoga instructor it's a great program and again it takes a shared experience and builds a community so laughter yoga is tip number five now we experienced this a little bit earlier when we had some technical difficulties. Stress management. Mike and I knew exactly what stress looks like. What we don't often realize is the little stressors. Things aren't going well at home or perhaps uh, just a setback in someone's health know that stress is part of our daily life. And again, research shows that chronic stress has debilitating effects to our brain. So again, my advice to you here is to acknowledge that we all have a certain level of stress. And because we now know about it, we can actually practice ways to again compensate for that underlying stress. Some of you may be familiar with Brene Brown. She's done a lot of work around stress and relationships. 
again, stress can be managed through so many different things for so many people. For some of you, it might be meditation. For some of you, it might be prayer. It can look like music, dance. It can look like so many things. But one of the great keys is learning how to be grateful. So again, tip number six is to identify a stress management practice that you can do every day, whether it's taking a five minute quiet break, it's something that you consistently do. So again, identifying something that's going to acknowledge that you do have stress and give you a way to cope with it, that's tip number six. Well, as you can see the Brain Booster 6, there is no magic bullet, but what there is, is an education, some tools that are connections to the community, and knowing that these are the areas that the experts identify as ways that you can improve and enhance a brain healthy lifestyle. Now, I talked about this earlier. We've got a map. We need to take action. So in all those six, six things we, just, we covered, ask yourself, what's a habit I might be willing to adapt? For some of you, it might look like doing the power of 10, making sure you try and walk in segments throughout the day. For others, it might be going to a farmer's market and looking for a rainbow. The next thing you want to do is what might be a barrier? Transportation, weather, respite care? Okay, acknowledge those. But what's more important, what is the solution? Ask yourself, what is the solution? But also ask others in your community. And when I say community, that might be family members, that might be social workers, that might be your support groups. So again, look to those in your community, invite them in to help you come up with an action plan that can support your brain health. If you're in San Diego, the Vital Aging Conference is coming up and that is actually going to be featuring Dr. Nussbaum that I mentioned earlier in the um, in the um, workshop. He's gonna be presenting and I will too. So it'll be nice to share the stage with him. So again, that's Wednesday, June 17th. And again, for those of you not in San Diego, I encourage you con to connect with your community centers as well as your senior centers because there is starting to be a wave of people taking this into the community. If you would like more information or have a question on it, perhaps something, I know we're going a little bit over time. This is my website and you're welcome to contact me. And Mike, I'm gonna turn this over to you now. That's wonderful, Judy. Thank you very much. That's a, just as better than I remembered. And um, yeah, I lost a, I probably got a couple of gray hairs from the stress today, but I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm going to go for a little walk here afterwards and, right. um, and offset that and get back my um, little bit of my my health there. So I did pop up um, a link straight to Judy's website there. So you can click that yellow button if it's not pop when it pops up or says check it out and I'll take you into another window. And um, so that's really great. And the Vital Aging Conferences are really, really good if you haven't been to something like that. And um, we also had um, Shiva also shared with us a link to Laughing Yoga. Oh, wonderful. Wonderful. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, laughteryoga.org. Yes. So that's, that's wonderful because we had a question whether it was a West Coast thing or... No, throughout, uh, the, throughout the world. that It actually started in India, which makes it, it, it all... What I like about that, that's universal. So you know it touches a part of our core. 
And hi, Marshall. We got Marshall on too. Marshall's um, helping us get some memory cafes going in San Diego. And those are great places to help if you, um, to get your loved one out and get that social aspect going, look for memory cafes because they're places where you can take, go and be around others that are going through the same um, journey or struggle. But it's a place for people with Alzheimer's to go and not be judged and have that social atmosphere and, and partake in some activities that will also help you as the caregiver. Right. And Marshall, I want to speak to that. What you're talking about is building your tribe. And I didn't have a chance to mention that, but that's exactly what you're doing. Building a tribe of people to support you. And that is so crucial in building that social capital and social network. It is, it is. And um, I, you know, I'm an, actually an introvert and, um, but I know once I get around people, I, I enjoy it and I like I you know, like having that social, so they yeah, just stay active. And I just want to thank everybody for you know staying with us, and um, we're together in this. And we we got through some technical issues, but hopefully you got some some good information there that you can go back and start working towards managing your brain health. And um, so th you know, thank you very much, Judy, for being on the show and and working through those those issues and um, we're going to continue to have more of these shows we're going to fight back against dementia and technology and we're going to win and um, so make sure you check out Judy's site also don't forget to come on over to together in this and um, check us out and I'm going to also pop up if you haven't joined our empowerment um, list because you want to join be a, notified about future webinars please make sure you get signed up for that so you don't miss out and that pop-up will be coming up here in a few seconds and if anyone has any more questions please I'll stay on for just a couple more minutes and um, get, we'll see what we can do there but um, anyway we'll keep your eyes open for follow-up emails and we make sure I ask for more questions and we don't have any. So with that, everybody, thank you. Have a wonderful evening and stay, stay healthy. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Judy.